Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, welcome into the program. Today on the show, we have uh, the one, the only, OWC. And if you haven't heard about them, then this is going to be a great place because we're going to have the CEO and founder of the company here to talk about everything that they are doing and really the latest of what they've been doing uh, and showed off at CES 2022. So uh, we already covered a little bit uh, about that when we did our CES you know kind of overview and top tech awards and stuff like that but don't worry everything is going to be explained and hey if uh, if you want to know how to really spruce up a mac because you know let's face it apple doesn't really um you know they don't really leave much room for i want to say like improvement or like modifying but owc has been making a business out of it for you know since 1988 and really uh some of the best in the industry when it comes to video editing, uh, storage, network attached storage, all that and more. So everyone uh, stay tuned for that. But before we get started, we of course have, uh, well, computeramerica.com. That's where we find everything, including a link to our guest website. Anything that we talk about should be right there. And on top of that, podcasts, uh, the video archive, social media links, uh, articles, reviews, all that and more. So everyone, computeramerica.com, that's all you need to remember. Or of course, you can head on over to owc.com as well. Uh, Now, with all that being said, let's go ahead, bring on our guest, and let's just have fun with this. Uh, joining us today is, as I said before, the CEO and founder, Mr. Larry O'Connor. So, Larry, welcome back onto the program. How you doing? Hey, really good. Thanks. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So let's, uh, you know, I gave a little bit of an introduction, but for everyone out there who, uh, you know, may be completely new to OWC, please give us a bit of your background and, uh, you know, mission statement and a bit of your background. Sure. Well, for over 30 years, you know, I've been driving OWC Ford you know, with the mission of you know, making technology better. I mean, it's taking existing computers and providing upgrade paths. You can well make them better than they were from the factory and then keep them going. You know, we continue to have a focus on, on supporting you know, systems that go back you know, a decade or more while we're bringing out the latest and greatest to keep you know, the things coming right off the lines today. Not just up to speed, but you know, prepared for the future. You noted that a lot of the Macs that are coming off the line don't have a lot of internal you know, expansion options, but in terms of external with Thunderbolt and, and the SD cards, you know, even the high-speed external SSDs, you know, we certainly have passed to continue to see those systems are supported as well. But I really should also point out, you know, we're not just a Mac company. You know, the software and the hardware that we produce, you know, from whether it be memory, docs, you know, our RAID technology, you know, that's supported across Mac, uh, Windows, and in some cases, uh, even Linux. So it's we're, we're becoming more and more agnostic to the platform you know, as we go forward. I mean, the most important thing is that the user experience with whatever you need to use, whatever you know, has to be part of your workflow, whether it's home or, or graphic, video production, gaming, et cetera, you know, we've got the right solutions that get it done for you. Yeah, and and of course uh, that's very important to note because uh, I'm of course using a a Windows as our listeners know, but uh, you know for a number of years now to kind of back up the show and everything like that, uh, we've been using an OWC. I think it's like a four terabyte drive to kind of store uh, store everything here in our studio. So you know that's not failed us yet. And yeah, uh, you know when it comes to that uh, that capacity, I mean. We had a very fun conversation with um, with I think Jennifer Sule uh, before when it came to just density and really demands of a uh, of your audience and, and you know of course you can have everyday you know computer owners computer users but you have you know, like I guess OWC is really known for your work with like video editing high density storage that kind of thing uh, what would you what would you say is kind of your target market is it everyone but I mean again you have a 
strong focus on video and sound editing as well. Well, you know, from the get-go, it's really been a focus to give everybody what they need. And uh, as we understood professional video and, and audio editing needs and that you know, 3D, uh, you know, special effects, VFX, you know, 4K, 8K, you name it, you know, we effectively brought solutions up to speed where, you know, there are folks that use our Thunder Bays that you know, provide you know, extra stores for home photos, videos, and backup. And those same Thunder Bays are, are capable and used in you know, major motion picture production. You know, the big goal was bringing accessibility to professional grade, enterprise grade solutions to everybody. And that means you know, we can do so at a, a really uh, a, a good cost for everybody while providing a quality and longevity in products that you typically don't see uh, in those kinds of price ranges in that consumer space. You know, we kind of avoided the, I guess you could say the, the commodity space of just cheap drives and you know, stuff right. that's you know, just to the bottom and have built solutions that are for everybody and built to last. So you don't have to be, you know, how do I say, you don't have to have a budget that, you know, some big studio might have. They have the best storage you know, at home and keep, you know, really what is today, you know, a priceless asset, your data, which includes, you know, maybe you know, your music collection, even more important, your, you know, your photo collection, your family photos, you know, your financial data, all those things that, you know, you really should have, you know, on a safe place, in a safe place, in your control, not, the, I mean, the cloud, you know, I, I think is a great place for tertiary backup, but having a place, you know, in your home business, you know, able to, in portable as well, where you own and control and, and, and can keep your own data safe. I think it's priceless and, you know, across everything, you know, we're always here to maximize technology and maximize the use of resources. You know, we build things to last. We build things with power supplies that include power supplies that are over spec for what they need. So the power supply isn't a stress around the system. Hmm. You know, we're not here. We're not here to provide products that, you know, are expected to fail in a couple of years and you go and buy a new one. I mean, we really want to provide you with products that are built to last. And right. that's storage. That's everything. So. Yeah, that, that's uh, and uh, I, I remember having this conversation because um, you obviously the prices uh, are going to be a little bit higher, but like you said, you're not going to run out and go buy a new one in three years. When let's see, I think like a certain number of hard drives are expected to fail from other uh, manufacturers. Uh, do you have any numbers, just real quick, off top of your head? Uh, you know, kind of what's your failure rate, or like what what would you consider an acceptable, you know, kind of uh, lifespan or failure rate of your products versus, you know, just something that's kind of more, you know, uh, consumer mainstream. You know, failure is you know for us is not an option. There's certain things certainly beyond our control, but nonetheless, you know, there's things we do to simply prevent failure. When you have a you know, power, I mean, looking at the power supply that comes with the drive is probably one of the easiest ways to take a look at what the expectations are for the longevity of that product and when it ought to be, when it's going to need to be replaced. You know, when you have a power adapter that barely has enough power to run the drive and has to go into a peak power mode during spin-ups or, you know, from wake to sleep or pure power up, you know, that's a power supply. The easiest analogy is an audio amplifier. You know, when you are looking to drive, you know, a sound system, you want, you know, it's hearing this 100 watts or 200 watts, whatever the output may be, is wonderful, but you're never going to crank it to 100% because if you're at 100%, you get a lot of distortion. And the same is, with, is also true of power systems. You know, the closer you are to the maximum of power system, the less clean that power becomes. And that's ultimately creates wear and tear on the bridges inside your, inside your external drive, which ultimately can lead to a failure. And we look at something like our soft rate system, with our rate arrays, and we've had actually, let's say a competitor, I mean, there, we have lots of, you know, pretty good, a lot of good relationships. There's a lot of great companies in the market, mm-hmm. you know, and there's no to be seen. There's some that, you know, I, that I won't name that really don't, shouldn't be around at all. But to the uh, the point of soft rate, you know, one of our competitors actually asked us, why would we ship software that would tell a customer that a drive, you know, was predicted to fail before it was actually failing? You know, maybe that's a two and maybe, you know, we have five-year warranties on a lot of our products. You know, we might just be a few months away from when warranty is going to be up and, hey, now you're telling them they got to come and <laughs> they get a drive swap. Like, you know, this is our customer's data. And that's the whole point. We don't, it's, you know, it's preventing, you know, we, first off, we want to do everything possible to prevent failure. And we're pretty confident in the selection of drives we use and the hardware to substantially reduce 
you know, failures that could be caused by you know, design that we control. And if there is any risk of data loss, you know, we do provide software which you know, looks at you know, the, uh, how the drive is performing, you know, what's happening with the drive, and can typically predict a failure three to six months before a drive is actually going to start causing errors. By the time SMART tells you that a drive needs to be replaced or a drive is having problems, right. you already know something's wrong, usually because you've been having different issues that have been popping up. You might be running the smart test, oh, everything's fine. And then a month later, oh yeah, that drives bad. So, oh, well, that's why the blue screening or crashing or you know, having you know, data loss for you know, on and off for these few months. It's not my computer, it's my drive. You know, We aim to tell you that there's an issue coming before that issue actually materializes. Right. So that, that's kind of where we prioritize uh, our customers and our, our, our customers' data. You know, and, and, best hardware. Mm-hmm. and I'm really glad that you, um, you know, really focus on that. Like I, I had a drive fail me a couple of years ago and trying to even diagnose because it was like my fourth drive that I have in my computer, even trying to diagnose a bad drive is uh, not the easiest thing in the world. So, uh, so yeah. And, and, you know, all of this should, uh, not be new to anyone who has, uh, you know, kind of listened to our segments together, but I did want to pivot a little bit to what is new because obviously CES 2022, it was a very different trade show. I'm going to ask about you and your presence uh, at CES because uh, a lot of companies that we've had on the program, they, you know, they had a very different experience than what they're usually used to. Um, I have to ask you, I mean, how was it? I know that, uh, you know, showstoppers was still going on. I know that, I know that the show floor was open, but uh, how was CES 2022 for OWC? You know, it was great being at a show and, you know, we really appreciate all the press that did come into the show, you know, in terms of, you know, foot traffic and people in general, it was, I've never seen a CES. It was so light. I mean, it was mm-hmm. probably played football in a couple of the halls, but it was, <laughs> it was still, a, you know, it, was, it was all in all, you know, doing the showstoppers and a couple of the other events, you know, we are glad that we were there. You know, we look forward hopefully to a much better attended the NAB but it's it's tough. I mean, it's it's you know with the, you know the impact, of course, you know the wonderful COVID that's going out there. And you know, these things are hard to predict. But all the same, it was a pretty good show for us, and we've got great. We were happy to be able to show off some of the new products at the show. And again, we just look forward to hopefully a better show next year. Yeah, I, and, and I know that um, you know we kind of stayed home and recorded, and you know had a lot of fun with that. But I am looking forward to a a, uh, a full fledged show because I think the last numbers, um, you know, before you had like five thousand vendors, and I want to say like two hundred thousand people. This one it was like 24, 2,500 vendors, and uh, I think just under forty thousand people. But still, a lot of stuff was shown off. Uh, companies, either if they you know, even if they didn't attend. Uh, I want to say that the innovation awards were some of the you know more more uh, more tough awards to earn this year because you know there were a lot of great entries and a lot of great people showing off what they've been working on and yeah I'm pretty sure that uh, OWC picked up a few of their own as well as well as you know some renown from um, uh, from sites like Tech Radar Pro. Uh, let's talk about what you showed off at CES because you have some really incredible stuff with, uh, let's see, we're going to cover the, uh, really the Atlas line of, uh, of memory storage. So I'll let you kind of tackle this however you want, but, uh, what did you show off at CES? Sure. We can start with the Atlas, you know, for a very long time, we've been in the, uh, the solid state space, you know, going into media cards is for the, you know, the next step for us. We definitely have the expertise and you know, more important than that, we have the customer, uh, based the use of those cards and have been able to give us exceptional feedback over the last couple of years as we've planned our move into SD as well as CF Express. So the Atlas we've officially introduced, it currently goes up to 256 gigabytes. It'll soon be expanded to double that. You know, those are the fastest V90 SD cards in the market space today. We publish real specs on them. It's not just, you know, here's the, the peaks. So those are sustained speeds that we put, put out on those cards. Those cards also use PSLC. So we're taking a TLC uh, a NAN and it's reduced a single bit, which substantially extends its lifetime. The long and the short of it is, you know, these are the most reliable and the fastest SD cards in the market and fast by design and, and by choice. And the same uh, will be coming true with the CF Express cards, which officially will begin shipping uh, around NAB in those cards. Uh, and we'll, we're hoping to have up to one terabyte shipping uh, by, let's say, by the NAB show. 
But this is a space that we have a lot of experience with, and we're really glad to be able to bring a product out that that's, that will provide consistent performance and great reliability. What and and you know this is a uh, you know kind of come from uh, coming from your site. You have some ideal use cases for um, you know some of this, but in your mind, when you create something like a two fifty six um, you know super fast read write um, micro uh, micro SD card, what do you really see this uh, being for? Because I, I know the professionals who deal with a lot of photos um, or shoot a lot of video, um, obviously they save time, but do you see this enabling other technology? I see here you have you know 360 VR, that kind of thing. Uh, what do you feel like introducing this will help your customers do? Like what markets or use case? Sure. Well, there's definitely a need and a demand. And I mean, whether you're shooting photos or doing 4K video capture, in some cases, you know, dual card, that even supports up to 8K. The other you know, aspect is certainly uh, you know, just about the size. I think mean, you know, even consumer cameras are starting to get pretty hefty in terms of the megapixels that they can, they're can they shooting at. You know, while it's not my you know, best space in terms of specialty, I do understand you know, the way file sizes have gone up and whether it's whether you need 32 gig or 256 gig, you know, based on your shooting load, you know, these cars certainly enable you to have the flexibility and the freedom to to shoot at will, capture, I mean, digital, as long as you got the capacity for it, is, you know, it's a lot cheaper than film. The other aspect is you know, how you offload you know, that data, you know, having high speed you know, ingest, being able to plug that into a reader and get that data off quick also means you can, for all purposes, recycle that card and get it back in the field, get it back in your camera shooting again. And I'd also point out you know, our readers, the built in readers in our dock products, you know, mm-hmm. from our Thunderbolt, all the way back to our Thunderbolt 2 dock to our current Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 docks, actually have to be the fastest readers in the market as well. You know, when we went to benchmark these, I mean, we've used standard, we've used the fast readers that we, we that professionals use, but it was really uh, you know, fantastic to confirm. And you know, now we have a car that we know is the fastest out there. To also see that our, uh, our the built-in readers in our docks provide function and performance that's but frankly, no less, and in many cases, better than the fastest standalone readers in the market. So if you have one of our Thunderbolt docks with a reader, with an SD reader, you don't need to buy it. You absolutely don't need to buy a separate reader because you've got something that's already as fast as anything out there. Perfect. Yeah, it's, uh, of course, um, you know, we're kind of looking here at this uh, very... I guess for people who are just listening on the radio, uh, we should also kind of describe that you have a very uh, iconic kind of look and design. I mean, it's not just that they're fast and they perform well, but uh, I guess design-wise, how how'd your team go about it? Because they look great. Well, you know, we've always had that out-of-this-world theme, and you know, that certainly, I think, has been well-translated into a lot of our products. You know, it's yep. clean. I mean, you know, we don't need to have a whole bunch of logos and stuff across the products. I mean, it's the, the products stand on their own because they provide the function performance and well, ex- expected reliability that our customers have. You know, that's, there's no reason they, they clutter them up. Yeah. And, and, you know, so clearly this can fit into any kind of Mac environment that they look great. They're super fast. And uh, I, I actually did not know that uh, these docks were as fast as anything else on the market. So that's really great. And you can see uh, the different docks here uh, that you have. Let's see the Thunderbolt 3 mini dock, uh, you know, all these, the, the hub. Um yeah, they, they look amazing. And so was it just kind of camera technology and stuff that we'll see at NAM again? Or uh, what else did you show off at CES? In addition to uh, the Atlas line, we also introduced the very first Thunderbolt 4 storage solution, which would be the Minisec STX. Now, you don't, just because it's Thunderbolt 4 doesn't suddenly make it, you know, a whole different world versus Thunderbolt 3. I mean, there's a lot of confusion in Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4, which you know, we, could, we could spend an hour just talking about, you know, those differences. But Thunderbolt 4 and peripherals, the primary benefit that you get from a Thunderbolt 4 device is the ability for that device to give you more Thunderbolt 4 ports. So in the mini stack, you, know, you effectively have our hub built into it, which gives you additional Thunderbolt 3, additional three outs for additional Thunderbolt 3 and 4 devices. Or you can plug USB-C video displays up to two into the Thunderbolt 4, uh, into the Thunderbolt 4 ports. In addition, it has two drives uh, inside, both up to two drives that supports a three and a half inch, up to three and a half inch, you also put a two and a half inch, but any SATA drive currently up to 20 terabytes and an SSD M.2 drive, which are currently available up to eight terabytes. 
you know, and pre-configured, you can buy a zero gig, put your own drives inside, mm-hmm. or you can buy it today with up to uh, 26 terabytes of, of total storage within. And this is a product, again, it gives you great performance for, your, uh, for those two drives that go inside. Plus, it's a hub, so it also supports additional devices or displays you may, may wish to connect. That looks like our Thunderbolt uh, 3 dock, which yes. is still, that's the thing. If you don't need more Thunderbolt ports in particular, but you need lots of you know, high-performance ports for your other peripherals, USBs, and there's also audio in and out, uh, uh, Ethernet, et cetera, our Thunderbolt 3 dock gives you one downstream 40 gigabit Thunderbolt port, but gives you additional ports for your peripherals. Again, Thunderbolt 4 is all about, any of our Thunderbolt 4 products today are all about giving you more downstream Thunderbolt ports in addition to other function. Thunderbolt 3, that's where you get high performance for your storage, your dedicated storage, dedicated external GPU chassis, and also you know, docks to give you additional ports and function and need more of the PCIe lanes. You know, we just introduced another, a brand new Thunderbolt 3 dock or Thunderbolt 3 Pro dock, an updated version, which gives you CF Express as well as USB and 10 gigabit ethernet. And that had to be a Thunderbolt 3 product just on the basis of how the lanes work. To do Thunderbolt 4, you only get one lane of the PCIe that Thunderbolt has available for the actual peripheral functions you put in the product. Thunderbolt 3 products with Titan Ridge you have the full 40 gigabits, the full four lanes that are available in Thunderbolt to give performance to the dock. So that's kind of the trade-off in Thunderbolt 3 versus Thunderbolt 4 products. And when somebody asks us when we're going to do a Thunderbolt, like our Flex 8, which is you know, one of our premier uh, Thunderbolt storage solutions mm-hmm. in terms of array and for mostly for video editing and, and, and audio, I mean, really high-end use. We have asked when there's, when's there going to be a Thunderbolt 4 version and I'm sure there will in the future when a chipset comes along that makes sense for that application under Thunderbolt 4. But today, if we made that Thunderbolt 4, we would literally reduce its performance, the performance of the drives inside its primary function, you know, by 75%. So, wow. yeah, but know, think of the, but, but think of the marketing, the marketing implications that you could have. You'd be like, hey, look, plus one number. This is great. No, I, it, clearly performance is, you know, trumps anything like that. But no, it, 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 you know, super speed. And I think for a lot of people out there, you know, kind of looking at, you know, 40, you know, 40 gigabits per second and, you know, 40 terabytes and whatever it may be. Um, this, of course, also goes all the way down to the consumer level as well. And just means that, hey, your stuff is going to transfer faster, even if you have, you know, a two terabyte, a four terabyte drive. Uh, all this just gets better at all levels, right? Absolutely. And again, the thing to remember when you're looking at Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4 peripheral, you, you don't buy it because it's Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4. Both will connect to your system with Thunderbolt Four, you buy it, or in the Mac world, anything with Thunderbolt 3 and OS 11 or later, you buy it for what functionality it gives you. You know, the only place where you really should be demanding a Thunderbolt 4 or really wanting a specific Thunderbolt, well, there's two places, I guess, would be on the computer side and the PC side. Thunderbolt 4 cleans up a lot of issues that, you know, a lot of inconsistencies that existed in the Windows space on different Thunderbolt 3 systems. You know, Thunderbolt 4 guarantees you on the Windows side of the uh, the platform that you're going to have all the functionality that, quite frankly, Thunderbolt 3 has been able to provide you know, since 2016. The other area where Thunderbolt 4 is fantastic is with cables. You know, mm-hmm. In cables, a Thunderbolt 4 cable is defined as universal. It will connect you to anything that has a C port on both sides. So going C to C, whether it's a USB-C device, whether it's just power, you know, whether it's 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit, 40 gigabit, whether it's 30 watts or 100 watts, the Thunderbolt 4 cables are 100% universal and you'll never have to wonder or guess if it's going to work with your device. And a lot of people out there have, you know, now collections of C2C cables that don't have good labeling. You know, some aren't even the, the full USB spec. And you go to use one of these cables and it's kind of a crapshoot. If you don't know that cable absolutely works, whether it's going to work with what you're trying to connect. And Thunderbolt 4 cables solve that. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the issue of connectivity and, you know, uh, multiple standards, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, especially next year, and I'm sure, you know, you, uh, you of all people are keeping up with this, but I think 
Apple is, you know, thanks to the EU, kind of being forced to switch over to USB Type C um, and away from like Lightning and stuff like that. So hopefully, you know, we start to see some uh, consolidation in the market when it comes to all these standards. But uh, really good to hear the Thunderbolt 4, you know, kind of does that already. So good to hear. Good to hear for sure. Uh, so we have that. We have uh, again just kind of storage, docking, uh, cables, and USB or uh, in, in Thunderbolt four. Uh, yeah, the, and and that's already you know so much. How has the response been to you know kind of your products? I don't know if you have gotten these into people's hands and gotten some feedback yet, but how how does all of this play out kind of in the field? Uh, good responses, I'm hoping. Yeah, great responses and. I mean, the, the mini stack, I mean, you know, demand certainly outstrips supply and, you know, some of that supply chain, others just, you know, demand has been really high in that product. It's the same with the SD cards. Folks who've gotten that card have really enjoyed using it because it, again, there's no fluff in the market. I mean, we lift, we list rather, you know, what it does, not what the spec says it should, you know, it can do, you know, but the theoreticals are of the spec. I mean, we provide the specifications for what our solutions do. So the expectations are real and those expectations and this is really important, or quite frankly, they come from our customers. These solutions exist because of customer feedback, both internal and extra. I mean, we are, this company was, you know, quite frankly, grew up and was built by customers that were you know, part of the OWC team, as well as customers that purchased from OWC externally. And we listen to our customers, you know, you know quite, uh, as I say, seriously when they give us feedback, when they have suggestions. And, you know, these shows are which is why we really enjoy going to the shows. I mean, if, if nothing else, you know, being in person in addition to all the other communication channels, but in person on a show floor, you know, there's you know, no better place to interact with our customers and you know, really get uh, you know, great ideas and great feedback on you know, what their challenges are, you know, what their pain points are and you know, what we can do to, to make that better. I mean, we're not here to try to say, hey, here's a great new whiz bang, throw everything you have away and buy this. <laughs> you know, which no. <laughs> I know there's some of the game out there, but you know, our goal is to say, hey, what, where's your pain point? What can we do to enhance what you have? You know, and not replace what, you know, everything else, but you know, come in with a solution that makes what you already have work better. And for the long term, it'd be future you know, compatible as well. You know, that's, right. that's really important. Yeah, and you know, um, really, all the pain points. I, I, I really just saw this: the the Klingon, the USB Type C connector securing device. Um, I'm sure everyone has had a cable fail because it got bent or twisted, or you know, just kind of bent in the wrong place on the cable. Uh, man, that's everything. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, Klingon was absolutely from field. You know, people. I mean, especially if, you know, if you're out, you know, not. A, I mean, in a home, even in a home environment, you know, things happen. I mean, it's, it's USB C can be really sensitive. You know, a little jiggle on the cable, you know, it's a, you know, with Thunderbolt 3, that's 40 gigabits. With the USB, even USB, uh, you know, 3.1 uh, Gen 2 is, and 3.2 is typically 10 gigabits out there. And it doesn't take a whole lot of a, of a wiggle to cause a problem with, well, that connection. And that could be a drive dropping. That could be something dropping while you're using it. And the Klingon was a real, I, I say it was a simple solution. It was actually not simple to engineer. For all freaking purposes, got to be. It was a it's a pretty precision uh, design product, right? But nonetheless, that came from consumer feedback. So yeah, we got the stuff. Somebody, whether it's a person in the field or it's an animal in somebody's house, you know, bumps the cable, right? Well, the cleaner takes care of that. And again, that out this world, you know, Star Trek has always inspired OWC. And while we do spell it with a C, you know, there's we, we certainly enjoy being on the the name that product Klingon. Right. Yeah. And of course, uh, I think that everyone can go and find this. We'll have links to all these products that we've talked about in the show notes. Um, I'm going to uh, give this chance, Laird, to, is there any other product or anything else uh, CES concerning that we didn't touch on? No, I think we covered the covered the span. I mean, it's just a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of a pretty broad product line that we offer. And the biggest you know, thing, again, I always you know, kind of point out and reiterate, you know, we really put your data first. All these products are designed you know, really to be to some degree boring and boring in the sense <laughs> that you know, once you put them into your, uh, you know, connect them to your computer, put them into that you know, workflow, you know, we don't want you worrying about the product. I mean, you're focused on what you need to do and that you can count on that solution doing what it needs to do to make that happen. 
Right. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, you know, there's a lot more information there. And uh, personally, again, we kind of use the, the Mercury uh, Mercury Pro line is what we kind of use the store. Uh, it just came back to me. But uh, with that being said, I, I always, you know, kind of ask you and your colleagues, uh, because of my background in environmental science, I was like this. Uh, there's also a pretty big focus on uh, sustainability, environmental consciousness, that kind of thing. Uh how, how's that going for you lately? I know that, uh, you know, kind of working from home and uh, COVID has changed a lot, but how has uh, OWC, you know, still the same mission to build a sustainable workplace and all that good stuff? Well, we continued even in the middle of 2020, we brought on more solar. We, I mean, again, we use, we believe in technology that sustains and enhances and extends the life of technology. You know, we build these solutions to last and we also apply technology to our own campuses you know, the use of, well, for our practical purposes, use resources efficiently. And you know, during COVID, we brought on a, a ton of additional uh, solar. We opened a couple of facilities and put solar on those facilities, large solar on those facilities, quite honestly. And the other, again, going right back to the core, I mean, it's the products themselves are designed to last. You know, we've continued to work to substantially reduce you know, non-recyclable material in both the solutions as well as the packaging. I mean, anybody who's been now, receiving our products over the years, certainly within the last year, we'll notice you know, the elimination of twisty ties, a lot of elimination of bags, a lot of you know, changes to the packaging, which still protect. I mean, very, you, know, you don't have sustainability if you ship a product out that's not protected and it gets damaged. I mean, that's a lot more waste than other, but you know, we've, done, we've done a lot to, uh, to ensure even you know, the products that you're receiving are sustainable. You know, going to reusable bags, you know, you know, bags you can take to the grocery store for all practical purposes, the, the drive scheme is. It, it makes it easy to pull the drive out of the box, and then you have a bag that you can reuse. You know, something else that we've continued to be involved with is Kiss the Ground, which has a big focus on regenerative agriculture. And it's, an, it's a passion area you know, for myself and a lot of people at OWC. You know, looking to you know influence use technology and just information to and quite frankly some of the technology the best thing about technology that you know, makes the world a better place is that it's been here for a very very long time right and you know, really excited to be focusing to have been involved with the production of uh, the kiss the ground movie and, and very involved with that organization now to promote regenerative agriculture which you know we do agriculture right and that includes you know I say everything from livestock to the corn, you know, we suddenly are able to sequester. You know, we have all, you know, it's very hard to stop certain areas of consumption, but mm-hmm. we can substantially improve the efficiency with, with which we produce, you know, that which we consume. And as a result, you know, more than offsetting, you know, different greenhouse gases and certainly carbon, you know, through sequestration, you know, versus you know, trying to reduce. We need to do both. And it's right. always fun to watch, you know, fusion's coming along. You know, there's a pretty good announcement on fusion technology. A, a test a couple De- definitely been readers. keeping up on the the tokamak and you know uh, i think it's like the 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 iter or something like that uh, out there in europe or something they fingers crossed on that one we're, we're a number of years from that uh yeah but but so sustainability and green energy and and you know you you have made it a focus i'm glad to hear that you uh you know kind of continue to do that uh i'm going to kind of wrap this up you know i wanted to kind of keep this around 30 minutes so uh sorry for cutting you off there larry but uh one last question this one from uh someone in the chat and it ties back into uh, sustainability a bit because hey if you throw out less stuff then you know that that helps there uh, they're asking about the estimated life cycle of a product uh, they didn't say anything in particular let's uh, just kind of go with maybe uh, I, I assume like the docks the failure rates fairly low and they'll be uh, they'll stay with you as long as the connection standards you know kind of exist let's go with like uh, hard drives do you have like an estimated lifespan of a hard drive uh, because I think most hard drives are expected to fail within five years like that's about the lifespan of an average hard drive uh yeah please you can't necessarily name the average span of a hard drive but yes typically after five years if you're actively using a drive it's a good idea to you know, move that drive to you know, a secondary role maybe it's, it's additional it's secondary tertiary you know backup you know certainly you have those things but if you're buying an enclosure the enclosure you know in terms of the way we build our solutions the enclosure is going to be fine it's going to be the drive that you reduce to a secondary role I said, there's certain things that you know we can't control. But the nice thing about drives, you know, there's actually a pretty good value in the recycling, relatively speaking. By but when you look at it by a pound basis, you know, there's those are highly recyclable, and a lot of materials can be recovered. And the big thing is you know, when I look at a drive, 
you know, when you have an enclosure that's built to protect the drive, protect your data, but, you know, also, again, provide clean power to that, to that drive, mm -hmm. you're extending the life of that solution as opposed to putting it into an environment where it's stressed. And, you know, in all of our products, again, we, by design, I mean, we're working to see these solutions have a long life. You know, we can't control mechanical failure on, uh, on a hard drive mechanism from you know, the various companies, but we can certainly provide the best, you know, I won't say odds are the wrong word, but the best environment to ensure that the longest possible life that product you know, can provide. Right. No, um, and perfectly said. So the, um, my last question, this is just, you know, one for me personally, since you were last on, uh, Apple's been doing things. They've been uh, they've been in innovating in a way that is uh, essentially cutting Intel out of the loop. Uh, how has the transition of Apple from Intel to their own silicon to M1 and uh, you know really everything that they're doing with their own processors has that affected your business at all, or does everything just you know memory wise, storage wise, does all that just work or? have you had to change anything from Apple, I guess, essentially building more of their own hardware? Well, on the hardware side, fortunately, again, the way we build hardware, I mean, it's, it's you know, especially in the Thunderbolt space, nice about Thunderbolt, it's a certified platform. It's a platform that has backwards and forward support. And by doing those you know, solutions right, you know, we don't have, we have not had issues going from Intel into the M1 world, into That's the great. Apple Silicon world. And I guess the, the most, the biggest challenge with M1 has been the software side. And certainly early on, that was a, I won't call it a headache. Well, maybe <laughs> we characterize it wrong, but it was a big lift uh, you know, moving, especially the storage side of the equation, you know, for with the compatibility. We even had, it, it took us a little you know, longer than, it, than Apple's initial release. I know it was probably about three or four months before we really had the support we wanted on Apple Silicon for something like software. But today, you know, it, we continue to have what, I would say is the absolute best sort of solution, whether you're Intel or Mac, and now Windows or uh, Mac for that matter. So the less more on the software side than the hardware side, just when you build hardware right, you know, that the compatibility is for it. And Apple's done a really great job with their Thunderbolt implementation, with the USB implementation, with their support in general. So we're pretty happy. But yes, I mean, these are challenges that even before Apple went from Intel to uh, M1, you know, every year there's, you know, there's new, uh, how do I say, bars to, to hop over and you know, we're, yeah. that's why we're here. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and uh, you know, we didn't even talk about your software solutions, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, kind of backup and Mac to PC and, you know, kind of uh, that whole side of it. But I think with that being said, I wanted to uh, keep this concise. And I know that we got a little off topic of CES, but again, um, you know, OWC did receive for the Atlas storage solution. Uh, that was one of our top tech awards. I think we handed out like five or six of them. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, we love the speed. We love, you know, just kind of the the density of it and what it really meant for you know uh I think a lot of people are like, oh, we need better screens for VR. We need better, um, you know, kind of connect connection standards, that kind of thing. But when it comes to making the content, you are f very, uh, very hard at work solving some of the issues that I guess people wouldn't even consider are limitations to the next generation of technology. So uh, I'm really happy that we had you on and uh, yeah, and just, you know, kind of say in person, congratulations. And your you and your team have been working very, very hard and yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. Hey, pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having us, Ben. We look forward to being on in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so everyone, once again, OWC.com or ComputerAmerica.com will have a link right there on our homepage. So, everyone, we've been talking to Mr. Larry O'Connor. He is the CEO and founder of OWC. And, yeah, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. So, uh, everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, catch you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>